This week, we're digging back into the archives. We're pulling papers from the Square and Compass magazine from 1937 and 1947. We're exploring the privilege of death. Freemasonry's connection to the ancient mysteries through the Comacenes, the Orphics, and the schools of Pythagoras at Crotona in southern Italy. Plus, an all-new Masonic Minute with Worshipful Brother Patrick Day. Was Jack the Ripper a Freemason? While many Masons and non-Masons alike cling to this idea, the facts tell a whole different story, and Patrick Day takes us through it. And finally, we're going to wrap it up with an example of what Masons were concerning themselves back in the 40s, and it has to do with cinema. All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 656. I want to thank our contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners of the WCY podcast. Thanks to you, we can make this show every single week. If you're curious on how you can help support the WCY podcast and bring the light of masonry and its kindred sciences to all those interested all over the world and maybe beyond, head on over to WCYpodcast.com and click on support the show. Thanks so much. In the news, you guys, it's finally happening. I've been working on a project and reading and reviewing, and Brother Steve L. Harrison has been busy, busy, busy. You have no idea the kind of work this man has been doing and is essentially the culmination of, gosh, two, maybe three years uh, just since I've known about the project. I'm going to read you a bit from his blog, the one minute mason.blogspot.com, because this is incredible. The Imperfect Storm New Information About the Morgan Affair. Now, before I go on, I will say that Steve Harrison has uncovered things in this book that are not just relevant to masonry, this is relevant to the nation. Enough fluff, let's get into this. A new book, The Imperfect Storm by Stephen L. Harrison, sheds new light on the most infamous cold case of the 19th century, the abduction and disappearance of William Morgan. The disappearance of William Morgan in 1826 sparked a wave of anti-Masonry across the United States. Morgan, a man with a questionable past and financial troubles, had threatened to expose the secrets of Freemasonry in a book. This angered Masons in Batavia, New York, leading to his arrest and subsequent abduction. The book explores the historical context of Freemasonry, the events leading up to Morgan's disappearance, and the aftermath, including the trials of those involved. It delves into the complex relationships between Masons, the internal divisions within the fraternity, and the public's growing suspicion of the organization. Key points include early Freemasonry and its divisions, the formation of the Grand Lodge of England, and the subsequent split between the moderns and ancients created tensions within the fraternity. These divisions carried over to the American colonies where lodges were established. The rise of anti-Masonry. Anti-Masonic sentiment existed before the Morgan Affair, fueled by religious opposition, suspicion of secrecy, and accusations of elitism. However, Morgan's disappearance intensified the sentiment leading to a widespread movement. Morgan's questionable Masonic background. There's no proof Morgan was a legitimate Freemason. He gained Masonic knowledge through dubious means, possibly by studying with prominent Masons or learning from existing exposures of the ritual. The events leading to Morgan's abduction. Morgan's plan to publish a book exposing Masonic secrets, especially those of the Royal Arch degree, angered Masons in Batavia. His expulsion from a local chapter further fueled his desire for revenge. The Conspiracy and Cover-Up Masons conspired to suppress Morgan's book, leading to his arrest on trumped-up charges and his eventual abduction. The involvement of high-ranking Masons and rumors of pardon from the governor fueled public outrage. The aftermath and trials. Morgan's disappearance led to numerous trials, but the mystery of his fate remained unsolved. The trials exposed the lengths Masons were willing to go to protect their secrets and fueled the anti-Masonic movement. The book concludes by highlighting the lasting impact of the Morgan Affair on American history. It raises questions about the nature of secrecy the abuse of power, and the importance of individual responsibility. 
The Imperfect Storm, which contains never-before-revealed information, new clues, new facts, and perhaps most importantly, new answers about the Morgan Affair, will be released in January. All members of the Missouri Lodge of Research will receive a copy of this hardbound 424-page book at no charge. Both hardbound and Kindle versions will be available on Amazon, selected libraries, and other commercial outlets. This press release was posted on October 21st, 2024 at 7.28 a.m. So how stoked am I? I'm pretty stoked. I think one thing that Steve doesn't do in this press release is to become too sensational. However, I think as you read this, the sensationalism will be created by those who are reading the book and have these light bulbs go off over their heads. What's in the book is incredible. Steve, I think he's, un- you might be underselling things a little bit, but the book is fantastic and you will absolutely be stunned by some of the things in this book. It is absolutely correct when he says that never before revealed information, clues, and facts are going to be in this book. There are things in this book that are going to blow your mind. I mean, that's just the fact. So again, The Imperfect Storm, new information about the Morgan Affair is going to be released January 2025, and we are all very excited. All right. First up this week, I've got three pieces that I've actually uh, pulled, curated, if you will, from three issues of one of my favorite Masonic magazines ever, The Square and Compass. So I'll be reading directly from the pages. This comes from Square and Compass, a journal of masonry established 1892, published in Denver, Colorado, July 1937, volume 46, number 5. And this article is from the Philalethes Society. Now, as you flip through this old magazine, something you may notice is the Philalethes logo, which, you know, I don't know that I've seen this logo before. And I don't think I have, because since I've been a member of the Philalethes, the logo has not been this, which has an Ouroboros, two intercross deltas, a square, and the words, there is no religion higher than truth. So, you know what, maybe let's lead a campaign to bring back the original logo for the Philalethes. I'll post a picture of it on the socials so you guys can check it out, but it's pretty cool. It should be noted that I picked this article for obvious reasons. The title, Freemasonry and the Ancient Mysteries. We have talked about this so many times, and we've talked, and I think we've gotten to a point where we've basically said, yes, there's likely elements of all of these ancient mysteries and really cool rites and rituals from antiquarian age and and uh, ancient societies all sort of amalgamated into what we do today. Is there a direct connection? No. But anyway, let's see what this has to say. Freemasonry and the Ancient Mysteries by Cyrus Field Willard, fellow of the Philalethes Society. Some months ago, in the Square and Compass, the writer stated that he had received a letter from Sir Frederick Pollock, president of the Masonic Study Society of London, and a fellow of the Philalethes Society, that he had discovered in the Journal of Hellenic Studies the link that connected our modern Freemasonry through the Comacenes Masters with the Orphic Brotherhood that took over the remains of the schools of Pythagoras at Crotona in southern Italy, after they were suppressed. He promised to send the writer a copy of his address to the Masonic Study Society, in which he went into the matter, but his death occurred a month or two later at the age of 84. He was a remarkable man, as all his English associates say, a splendid Greek scholar and a member of many learned societies in England, as the string of letters after his name would indicate, being LLD, DCL, KC, and his Masonic rank indicated by PD Grand Reg. Fortunately, the writer had written to him to send him a copy of this address, which was answered after his death by his solicitor, to whom a similar request was also made. In due time, with the customary English leisureness, a copy of this address was received, no doubt owing to the presence among the officers of another fellow of the society, J.S.M. Ward, author of The Hung Society, and many other books. And with it came a reprint, or engraving, of an Orphic bowl, or rather, in it around the edge is represented the engraving which is labeled Supplement to Volume 
13 of the transactions of the Masonic Studies Society. A series of nude figures of men and women, 16 in number, who are all giving the sign of the Fellowcraft degree. In some cases, the hands are reversed, the right hand being replaced by the left hand, which is common among the old mystery signs. As the writer, while editing the Master Mason of San Diego, took a copy of what we term the Book of the Dead from the public library and sketched from it the different signs of all three degrees, placed them on a sheet of paper and had a page cut made showing that the Egyptians used the same sign as we do in Freemasonry, and printed the cut in that magazine with a note saying that any Masonic editor in the United States could secure the use of this cut by requesting it, but no other Masonic editor seemed to realize the importance of the discovery. In that cut, the sign of the second degree was reversed in some instances, just as in the engraving. It is so realistic in its portraiture of the naked bodies of the men and women depicted that the writer would not care to take the risk of sending it through the mail if Anthony Comstock were alive as he had a morbid desire for such things. This Masonic Studies Society, it seems to the writer, is of more interest to American Masons than Couture Coronati Lodge publications, as it is more universal and less parochial, and it does not deal with the same subjects of research. Judging by Volume 13 now at hand, the Society was established in 1921 to study the symbolism of Masonry in its various degrees and to investigate its origin and meaning. On July 16, 1935, Sir Frederick Pollock delivered his address to the society which was entitled Link Between the Comacene Builders and Orphism, in which he said, in 1927, I read a short paper calling attention to the confused Pythagorean tradition preserved in our earliest documents of English Freemasonry, who is termed in some American jurisdictions our ancient brother Pythagoras and its importance is pointing to a connection through the Italian Fellowship of Collegium of Builders, whom we call the Comacene Builders, with the South Italian Orphic societies who had taken over the remnants of the suppressed Pythagorean schools. I can now produce the missing link in the chain published in Volume 4, Part 2 of the Journal of Hellenic Studies, issued January 1935. The authors had no thought of any relevance to Freemasonry. It may be taken as settled that the Comacene tradition was imported into England by Italian and French master masons in the Middle Ages, and was the foundation on which the modern Freemasonry was ultimately built. Remember that the Comacenes were cosmopolitan and, above all, local trade guilds. One capital link was supplied by Brother Ward when he discovered the sign now familiar to us in the second degree in a Pompeian fresco, but there was still no proof that this had anything to do with the Orphic societies until this journal was published and gave a print of what is an Orphic bull certified as such by bearing manifestly Orphic inscriptions, the material being alabaster. Nothing certain can be alleged as to its place of origin, save that it comes from the eastern Mediterranean region, nor of the date, but it is attributed with sufficient probability to some time in the last two centuries of the Western Roman Empire. The question of possible modern forgery has been considered and a clear decision in favor of genuine antiquity has been arrived at. The interior curve of the bull is filled with figures of nude worshippers and high relief making signs apparently of adoration. Four of these exhibit the same sign as the Pompeian fresco. One makes it with the position of the hands reversed. The inner center or omphalos of the bowl is filled with a dragon, which is certainly an Orphic symbol. Very few instructed masons can believe at this day that the edifying interpretation of our sign of the second degree, which figures in our ritual as anything better than an 18th century invention, any such belief is now made impossible. If a personal excuse for this brevity of these notes were needed, I should have a good one. If my choice had been free, I think that brevity would still have been the best. Then follows the discussion in which additional information is given, which is here condensed. An article by R. Delbruck and W. Volgraft in the Journal of Hellenic Studies is quoted entitled An Orphic Bull. This bull is now in the possession of Dr. J. Hirsch of Geneva. It comes from the Mediterranean area. It is of alabaster and measures approximately 22 centimeters diameter at the top. It was worked freehand without the lathe. 
A deep point in the middle of the bottom indicates that the compass was used to control distances. The carving was done with some form of knife. In the center is a circular emblem with an egg pointed omphalos or familiar type. On the bottom at the edge is a molding on which is cut a Greek inscription of Orphic import. Around the omphalos is coiled a dragon. There is also an open flower with four overlapping rings of petals. In the concave interior stand 16 naked figures set radially, heads under the lip, feet to the center, four old men, three young men, and nine young women. Arms and hands are held chromatically in devotional poses. One hand rests somewhere near the heart, the other is raised palm outward in the attitude of prayer. But this happens only in the case of the men, who therefore are praying on behalf of the women. The men seem to be infibulated, an indication of cult chastity. Cult nudity is no unusual thing and is expressly attested for the Orphics. The inscription includes a line from an Orphic hymn which is quoted by Macrobius as proof that the real divinity of the Orphics was the sun. The date of the bolt is probably 3rd to 6th century AD. It is, so far as we know, the only representation of a cult scene from the jealously guarded Orphic Mysteries. The words may be considered as passwords among the faithful. The Orphic Mysteries were established by Orpheus, which means literally the tawny one in Greek. Esoteric tradition identifies him with Arjuna, the disciple of Krishna. He went around the world teaching the nation's wisdom and establishing mysteries. His going to Hades for Aradice is another point of resemblance with Arjuna who went to Atala, or the Antipodes, America, and married the daughter of the Serpent King is another point of resemblance. It is suggestive. He is considered dark in complexion by the Greeks, who were never very fair-skinned themselves. The Orphic mysteries followed in time those Bacchus of Dionysos, but differ greatly from them. For the mysteries of Orpheus were of the purest morality and severest asceticism. They taught all things emanated from the divine essence and returned to it after many evolutions and incarnations, which is pure Vedanta philosophy. In the discussion on Brother Pollock's address, Brother Ward told of the fresco he saw in the Temple of the Builders or Collegium of Roman Architects at Pompeii, within a stone's throw of the Orphic Temple, and said that Betty tells of these Comacene masons coming to England to build the churches at Yarrow and Wearsmouth. And in former lecture on the Egyptian mysteries of Isis at Rome, it told of its connection with the Orphic mysteries. This discovery bears out what the writer has always maintained, that Freemasonry, like those mysteries of Egypt and Greece, is a method by which initiation teaches the reason for morality and the search for the higher knowledge of man's divinity such as Jesus taught when he said, Know ye, not that ye are gods, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. More and more, the connection between the ancient mysteries and Freemasonry is being shown as more such things as this Orphic bowl are discovered. These mysteries taught by initiation and dramatic representation, as does Freemasonry, certain moral and ethical truths only being somewhat more inclusive as giving some idea of the composition of man and the universe with the reasons for a future or continuous existence after death. So there you have this really interesting article talking about this potential connection between Orphic traditions and the various mystery traditions in Egypt and, and other ones that came from Greece and their connection to Freemasonry, which I think we have talked about in the past and I think some of the interesting pieces that uh, Brother Patrick Day has put to us over the last year or so has sort of talked about some of the misinterpreted or erroneously interpreted ideas of certain groups or guilds and their influence on masonry as being uh, sort of erroneous when talked about in the sense that, you know, masonry came from those orders. But this was a little bit different. Um, I do think that there's something going on with coma scenes, but I just don't know enough about it. So I think we'll keep our eyes open for information on Comacene orders. I loved the idea of this relief of this Orphic bowl that they're talking about. And, you know, it made me think about this artifact that my father had before, and when he passed away, uh, became something that my mom packed up, and I only recently unpacked it out of a box. 
and I just don't know what to do with it yet, but um, I'll have to post a picture for you guys all on our social medias because it is a pretty incredible piece. It's a piece It's a piece of stone with a white marble carving of the gods on it. Uh, it's pretty incredible. Nonetheless, really cool piece. Obviously, it's referencing some things from other articles that uh, had been published beforehand, but apparently the, the guy who wrote it and talked about these links uh, had passed away before they had a chance to really check out anything, but a fun piece nonetheless. We've got more coming right up. I want to take just a moment to throw a big thanks out to Masonic Revival, Edgar Alejandro and Nick Harvey, for all the work that they do in bringing contemporary designs to masonry. They have produced our producer's pin, and they have done the last three batches, I guess you would call them, of our pin, the most recent design, I had sent them a kind of a mock-up of what I was looking for, and they came back with something, some alterations to the design that r- just made it pop. And I have to say, I really love it. They did a fantastic job. I just want to say thanks to them, and the way we can say thanks is to let everybody know about them, and that's what I'm doing. So if you've never heard of them before, go to MasonicRevival.com. they got a great newsletter that comes out. You don't have to worry about getting tons of spam emails from them. It's good. That set aside, sometimes I, people say, well, what do, you, what do you mean contemporary designs? And what I mean by that simply is a modern take on design. It's not the same old just, you know, tie with a thousand different square encompasses all over it. Uh, we're talking about uh, the Masonic designs that have been added to, in an elegant way, things like paisleys or very discreet type imagery that is appearing on, whether it's a pocket square, a tie, a bow tie, or even key rings and things. So uh, do yourself a favor, check it out, and I hope you enjoy it. Now, the next article that I wanted to bring to your attention is... A piece that comes out of, again, the Square and Compass magazine, a journal of masonry. This particular one was issue number 7, volume 46, September 1937. And again, I'm reading a article in the magazine that falls under their section for the Philalethe Society. Again, they use that super cool logo. Anyway, this article is called Getting Ready to Die. And as I first read this, I really thought about it in terms of an article that had been written within the book called The Master's Lectures, which was published by Evans Lodge. In that book, they have a section that's about uh, life and death. And this article reminded me of that original piece, but it has its own greatness. So let's check it out. Getting Ready to Die by Ernest Critchen, M.D., 32nd degree, and a fellow of the Philalethe Society. Not that I am tired of life. Not that the grasshopper is a burden nor the grinding low, though I go inevitably towards the beneficent goal. Kind providence appoints each as his entry into a larger life. Contemplating my end, what should I do as preliminary? Pay debts, yes, but these are not merely pelf and plunder. I owe many for courtesies, kindnesses, thoughtfulness, consideration, how can these be paid even though constantly handed on to others on the way? These are debts as much as a grocer's or a doctor's bill. Then there are harsh words, inconsiderate quips, sneers, jibes, angry shouts, recriminations, criticisms, censorings, judgings, and condemnation of some who opposed or disagreed with my notion of how to run the universe. How can these be rubbed out? cancelled, amended, and discharged. It is harder to pack my trunk for this journey than to prepare for any other yet considered. Just how to begin, what give away, throw away, and where to throw some things or influences that no one else may find. What of the habits, appetites, thoughts, conjurations, musings I have sedulously cultivated and woven into my spiritual self? Must I carry these along? Some may be parts of the deep damnation of my taking off. They do not hinder my entry into spirit life, but may shame, humiliate, handicap, affright friends and associates whom I have longed to meet again and know to love and be loved by. Each reflects in spirit life the features and attributes he has assumed, how I will appear. Things in the saddle and ride men, and harry him, 
in sleep, the strenuously hunted things that men covet and sell their souls for, things, lands, money, honors, place, furniture, ships, shoes, and sealing wax, these must be disposed of before I go, if I am to rest easy. It is said the most wretched man in spirit life, next to the suicide, is the miser. The fact that the spirit leaves its physical tabernacle so readily, painlessly, unconsciously more readily and painlessly than in the counterpart, birth declares it no evil to die. It is a change for salutary purpose. God is good. All natural laws are rigid and salutary. Beneficence is writ large on all his works and etched in the rules of nature. It is when we try to subvert or break them that they break us. We assume bodies to function on physical plane. We put them off to return to spirit planes. There has been no death, save as the cellular particles of the body disintegrate and are cast away, being utilized by other entities of plant, vegetable, and animal life for their own temporal needs. They in turn soon discard these elements. Chemical activities renew and adapt these particles to the uses of other entities who likewise are playing their momentary parts on the stage of earth life. Death is not a short step in the ever onward progress. Death is a step, a short step, in the ever onward progress of the evolving soul. Nor is egregious man the only elect possessing soul element. He is not the acme of creation, nor was all creation made for his delectation and pride. The countless trillions of worlds proclaim man a small factor. Death is as universal as birth, and applies to all creation, even to suns, moons, and stars. Why are we fearful? Why clothe it with hideous apprehensions and vague superstitions, imaginations, or distrust of the majestic Creator's designs? There are no accidents. Every incident has antecedent cause. All is foreknown and foreordered by law, cause, and effect. All is beneficently meant, yet we are prone to whine lament, and self-pity, doubting the kindness of God. There are many roads to heaven as thousands of self-appointed prophets, leaders, teachers, priests, soothsayers, magicians, and mediums claim vicegerency. They make our way, confidently, mostly through the bogs and briars of belief, uncertainty, and the back sheesh always a quid pro quo and always vicariously saving us from something we nor they know much of. It is chiefly saving us from personal responsibility, someone else to pay our debts. Without truth being built into the soul, without spiritual development cleansing through personal effort and experience, untrained in green, unfit for companionship of transcendent virtue and goodness, what awful embarrassment for the newcomer on the spiritual sphere or into the assumed heaven, what a great surprise awaits most of us, translated directly into the presence of the supernal. What appalling shame would be ours to be without that wedding garment of a clean heart and right spirit. Who can stand in such holy place? Transformation of soul and fitness for the paradise are not magical changes. There is spiritual perception that must be opened before spiritual conditions are comprehended, experienced, or enjoyed. Ethical precepts are invaluable, but there must be training of thought, sharpening of intellect, Evolving of perception, air, the neophyte is capacitated to enter the joy of his Lord. Only by conscious realization of what is now the unconscious, the nascent being that is to be born in the heart, the comprehension of an existent God of love, with love of fire within. How dwells the love of God in the heart of man who loveth not his brother, who robs, steals, injures, debases, and selfishly imposes upon another? There is no way of paying debts but by paying, pay up. Do not shirk nor whine. All have to be paid in full, sometimes, somewhere. Some have done their best and failed to wipe out obligations. Be assured, hell is not paved with good intentions. And it was a falsehood when first spoken by that antiquated bishop. The well-intentioned man who honestly tries will receive markings of merit for every effort at reparation. The sincere intention is just as apparent in the spirit as an act fully performed, the human aura itself is a photography of spiritual states, purpose, and actions. It is indelibly portrayed on the Akashic form, plainly readable by all on the spirit plane. For there is no disguise of thought or purpose, 
We reap what we sow. Is it not just and rational? What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly and righteously? Dang. I really like this piece. In fact, I think we're going to add this to the next issue of the Lyceum where you can read it in print. But it is absolutely a wonderful piece in that it describes the transformation that death is and not a actual death. The word itself means nothing to those who I think would say they know that what this transformation is is no end but a progression into the next stage of being. And to the other point, that your well intentions are counted amongst you in positive ways, and that we do all have debts to pay. And I love that he calls attention to the idea that these debts aren't just monetary. These debts are spiritual debts. Someone casts a smile to you, and you feel better. You repay it by smiling back. Someone holds a door for you. You repay it by holding the door for another. These things, and they pile up. You might find them such, maybe described as karma or something along those lines, but I think more broadly the way it's portrayed in this particular piece is very poetic and I think deserves our attention. In a digital landscape filled with historical inaccuracy, out of context quotes on memes and sound bites, there is an epidemic of fraternal occult, mythological and historical misinformation. It's time to set the record straight. Masonic Mythbusters with Patrick Day. Was Jack the Ripper a Freemason? The whole idea of Jack the Ripper being a Freemason was first popularized by Stephen Knight in his 1976 book, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution. A weird title to pick, but okay. I mean, Final Solution just reminds me of the Nazis. Anyway. The idea that the Ripper may have been a Mason was eh, probably floated around in the late 19th century, but the larger conspiracy that he could have been a Mason was first popularized by Stephen Knight. If his name sounds familiar, it's because he also wrote the book The Brotherhood, The Secret World of the Freemasons, published in 1984. If you've listened to Mark Tabert and Robert Cooper's Masonic Authors Guild International Review, of Knights the Brotherhood back in April 2024, much of their criticisms are equally applicable here. Knight is a journalist, not a Mason, and in fact is kind of an anti-Mason, so just FYI. And that colors his arguments and narrative. As Tabard and Cooper point out, Knight is following in the footsteps of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein's All the President's Men a journalistic expose of the breaking of the Watergate scandal, and many other journalists sought to make a name for themselves by producing an equally sensational journalistic expose, and Stephen Knight is one such person. This book was so captivating that it inspired Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell to create the graphic novel From Hell, which spanned the years of 1989 to 1999. And the graphic novel would be adapted into the 2001 film From Hell, starring Johnny Depp, Heather Graham, Ian Holm. I will say that the movie is just absolute garbage. I know of lodges that have played this movie for lodge education. Okay. The graphic novel is actually, well, it's kind of good for what it is, but the movie was just bad. It's bad. These ultimately are the works that have solidified the notion that the Ripper was a Mason in the minds of both Masons and non-Masons alike. Yep, anything you've read or heard since on the possibility that the Ripper was a Mason, they're all derived from these works. Books like Jack the Ripper, The Final Chapter, the recently published They All Love Jack, and others. And they add nothing to the narrative. They all follow Stephen Knight, and they just reheat the same garbage journalism. So, was the Ripper a Mason? 
I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, the basic issue here is that we have no idea who the Ripper was. Like, there are people we know who they were. We know their lives. Nearly every detail of their life has been scrutinized. And we're still not totally sure if they were a Freemason or not. Thomas Jefferson is a great example. The, the debate still continues if he was a Mason. But Jack the Ripper? We have no idea who he was. He has been speculated to have been uh, a Jew, a leather worker, a gentleman, a butcher, an uneducated John, a woman, the Jane the Ripper theory, a surgeon, and a Freemason. I, the roster of names of who the Ripper could have been, it was long and exhausting by the end of the 19th century, and that list has only gotten exponentially longer since. It's easy to point the finger at anyone as being the Ripper because it really doesn't matter at this point. I mean, the Ripper murders happened 150 years ago, so whoever he was, he's definitely dead, and anyone who knew him is dead, and their children are very likely dead. Whoever he was, the mystery of his identity is buried in the grave, and no one can unbury his identity. Speculating on who the Ripper was is not the same as a serial killer who is currently active or recently active. To give an anecdote, I'm thinking of a coworker of mine who grew up in Wichita, Kansas in the 1990s at the height of the BTK murders. He told me about neighbors, friends, coworkers of family who had been arrested and interrogated. There were repercussions for pointing the finger at someone with flimsy or no evidence. But the Ripper, well, what does it matter? No one's going to be affected, so you might as well blame the Queen or the Freemasons. For all we know, an alien race called the Vorlons abducted Jack the Ripper, and he now serves as their inquisitor in 23rd century intergalactic diplomacy. And that's the only reason he stopped killing. Now, before proceeding, uh, I tend to provide a content warning when I think it's necessary, and it's definitely necessary here. Since we will be exploring the Ripper murders, which were horrific and grotesque, I'm going to give a content warning. I'm not really going to be getting in, you know, to the murders and their explicit details uh, in any considerable depth. If you want some really in-depth explorations on that stuff, there's plenty of material out there in books and podcasts and documentaries, video essays, etc., However, I will be getting into some of the gruesome aspects of the murder, so if you're uncomfortable with discussions of sex workers, murder, corpse mutilation, uh, this is your warning. Okay, so what is Stephen Knight's argument in this book? Well, it's actually kind of an intriguing narrative at face value, but it's not really solid evidence. His whole thesis is predicated upon the testimony of a man named Joseph Gorman who claimed his real name is Joseph Sickert, the son of Walter Sickert. Walter Sickert was a 19th century painter who had been accused of being the Ripper, largely owing to his fascination with the Ripper murders. He even did a painting recreating the murder, recreating the murder scene of Marianne Kelly, which he painted in the room of her murder. Kind of a grotesque guy, but uh, that's not really evidence that he brutally butchered five sex workers. However, Joseph Gorman uh, would claim that his father confessed to him this wild story of how Prince Albert Victor Edward, the Duke of Clarence in Avondale, began an affair with an East End sex worker named Annie Elizabeth Crook, who was a Catholic, and they would marry and have a daughter named Alice together. Uh, Stephen Knight presents this as a threat to the integrity of the royal family, namely to prevent a Catholic from being capable of assuming the throne. Thus, a few Masons contrived a plan at the behest of the Marquess of Salisbury to eliminate the women who knew of the affair, and thus was born Jack the Ripper. Now, why Walter Sickert was never targeted by the Ripper is never really addressed you would think you would go after him, but nope. Now, there are two big issues I have with this book. Firstly, while there is a bibliography, there are no citations provided throughout the text. Uh, this makes it difficult to determine where exactly is he getting the information he provides. 
For instance, Knight tells us of a covert mission to access the sealed documents on the Ripper case in Scotland Yard, and how he had to meet with people, gain their trust, etc., to get access to these files. It's like he's really trying to contrive a story that makes it seem like he has his own deep throat. Then he quotes portions of these files. Uh, these are intriguing, and some of these files were actually already public, such as uh, Inspector Abilene's reports, which were found in his memoirs. Earlier this year, in 2024, Scotland Yard actually finally made the Ripper files public, and they went up for auction. Now that they are public, we can fact check Stephen Knight. And I reviewed these documents since I'm a bit of a amateur ripperologist, and guess what? Surprise, surprise, nothing he quotes from these files are actually found in the files that were released. Shocker, I know. The second issue I have with this text is that Knight, he uses these cute little nicknames throughout. Like, for instance, from time to time, he will call Prince Albert Victor Edward. I mean, admittedly, that's a mouthful, but he calls him Eddie. And sometimes he will call Mary Kelly, the last Ripper victim, Marie Kelly, and other times simply Kelly or Marie. And it, which is weird because he makes it a point to give the exact spelling of the individuals, especially the victims. And then he doesn't follow his own standard. Look, there are a lot of people involved in the Ripper murders, and it gets confusing, especially since the consistent spelling of names was not exactly a standard in 1888, especially among poor, illiterate people. Being consistent helps in a case like this, and giving them nicknames is just worse. And I don't know what it serves to give anyone in a nickname like a book like this. Uh, it, it certainly makes it even more difficult to follow Knight's narrative. Now let's dive into the testimony of Knight's informant, Joseph Gorman. Once again, Knight is trying to make it seem like he has his own deep throat. And he, he illustrates a covert means of meeting Gorman and gaining his trust. Now the basic narrative of how the Ripper came to be is as follows. Prince Albert secretly wanted to be a, an artist and began learning the art of painting from Walter Sickert, an avant-garde painter in London. Sickert would introduce the prince to a sex worker in the East End, Annie Crook. They would marry in secret. Uh, since Annie was a Catholic, they decided to have a Catholic wedding. Then they had a child, Alice. Joseph Gorman would claim that he then later married Alice. The illicit wedding of the prince and Annie was found out by the royal family. So a riot in the East End was staged in order to abduct the prince and Annie to separate them. And then their child was secretly put into the care of Walter Sickert. Yeah. Now, because Prince Albert was a Freemason, the Masonic fraternity in London got involved. Sir Charles Warren, the police commissioner, was also a Mason. Sir William Gull, one of the physicians to the Queen Victoria, was also a Mason. So obviously, they're all in a plot together to remove the illegitimate child who could assume the throne and to eliminate anyone who knew of her. And these men being Freemasons, they decide it would be a grand old idea to incorporate some Masonic symbolism in their mm, grotesque murder spree. Night. He spends a good deal of ink and paper discussing the murders themselves, and then more ink and paper spent on discussing Freemasonry, so he spends a lot of page space trying to apply Masonic symbolism to the Ripper murders, albeit not very convincingly. For instance, the victims all had their throats slashed. I mean, yeah, I guess that could be considered Masonic, but... I, if you're going to kill someone, you only have so many ways to do so quickly and efficiently. Cutting the throat is pretty quick and efficient. Seems more practical than Masonic. One argument Knight uses is that uh, William Gull was involved, is given his surgical knowledge. Thomas Bond, who was the police surgeon during the murders, uh, he was asked his opinion of the mutilations, and he indicated his belief that the Ripper may have had surgical knowledge. However, this has been contested, given that these murders are not exactly clean or precise. Marianne Nichols was killed with two cuts to the throat. 
She was stabbed in her vagina and disemboweled by a jagged cut in her lower abdomen. This does not exactly sound surgical. Annie Chapman had two cuts to the throat, disemboweled, having her intestines pulled over her shoulders, and her uterus, bladder, and vagina were removed, which was also rather sloppy. Elizabeth Stride had a single cut to the throat, but no mutilation. The prevailing theory is that Jack the Ripper was interrupted after killing her, and thus could not proceed with any mutilation, so he went off to find another victim that same night, in which he found Catherine Eddowes. She was killed by a single cut to the throat, disemboweled with deep jagged cuts to the abdomen, intestines pulled over her shoulders, and a kidney and the uterus removed. In the infamous From Hell letter, Jack claims that he ate half the kidney and sent the other half to George Lusk of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee as proof he killed Eddowes. I mean, of course, a medical student at the time could also get a kidney and send it as a joke. Now, Edo's mutilation is one that Knight and others latch onto for a Masonic connection. Part of her right ear was cut off, though this is probably from the cutting of the throat. Her nose was cut off, and uh, small incisions were made on her cheeks, two lines pointing up, like triangles pointing to her eyes. I guess a triangle without a base pointing to the eyes is kind of like the all-seeing eye. I guess. I, a, a portion of her bloodied apron was found at the entrance of a nearby tenement. Could this be a reference to the Masonic apron? Then, above the scrap of apron was inscribed in chalk on the wall graffiti that read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Fantastic English grammar there. Uh, the spelling of Jews is uh, J-U-W-E-S, and this leads Knight to suspect that, that there's a Masonic connection to the ruffians. That graffiti was ordered to be washed away by um, Sir Charles Warren as he feared it would incite riots and violence against the Jews of the East End. Now, because Warren was a Mason, Knight figures he saw something Masonic in this spelling or message, and that's why he ordered it to be washed away. Before the Dear Boss letter, which was the first letter received by the police that is believed to authentically have been written by the Ripper, and from which he gives himself the name Jack the Ripper, uh, before this letter, the press called him Leather Apron, thanks to some spurious information given by the press. Uh, a Jewish leather worker was arrested, but he was released due to lack of evidence, and the Jews were targeted heavily throughout the Ripper murders, owing to intense anti-Semitism that was just rampant in London at the time. Look, it's, it is admittedly difficult to pick apart Knight's arguments and so-called evidence because it's all convoluted and tenuous. I mean, everything about the Ripper murders and the, and the investigation is already confusing and bizarre. I mean, five women can't be brutally murdered and mutilated and not a single solid suspect ever produced, and the whole thing not appear confusing and bizarre. I mean, I guess for the sake of it, I should tell you about the fifth murder, that of Mary Kelly. Uh, her corpse would be mutilated beyond all recognition and is by far the worst of the mutilations that I just really don't even want to get into it. If you want to, there is an official police photograph of the crime scene and warning if you go looking for it, it is gut-wrenchingly grotesque. And whereas the other three women who were mutilated, the mutilation, they could not have taken more than five minutes. But Kelly's mutilation had to take about two hours. Uh, the others were quick because their mutilations occurred out in the streets. But Kelly's mutilation occurred in the privacy of her tenement, affording the Ripper more time to work. Now, there are other murders that are believed to be the Ripper or argued to be the Ripper before and after these five murders, but these are the canonical five. Catherine Eddowes mutilation is the one that is primarily used to support a Masonic connection, uh, the others simply because their throats were slashed. To a degree, Kelly's savage mutilation is sort of argued for a Masonic connection, namely that some of her viscera may have been burned in the fireplace. It's all 
very loose and tenuous. But here's the thing. The mutilations were done very quickly. Now, I used to raise and slaughter goats, and I have field dressed a few deer in my time. Taking intestines out is not exactly a quick operation. I mean, even if done sloppily. It, yeah, they, they kind of fall out, but uh, there's a lot of sinews and things that hold things together in the belly. It still takes cutting and pulling, and that is after exsanguination, as the corpse begins to cool. Everything in the Ripper murders was done rapidly and savagely. Someone high on adrenaline trying to mutilate a body in the streets of London probably is not going to take the time to execute some thoughtful Masonic homages. It's just, it's all too hasty. So let's do a thought experiment here. In the chaotic and savage Tate LaBianca murders of the Manson family, Jay Sebring was stabbed seven times, Abigail Folger was stabbed 28 times, Wojciech Fakowski was stabbed 51 times, the pregnant Sharon Tate stabbed 16 times, with Lino LaBianca stabbed 41 times, and Rosemary LaBianca stabbed 16 times. A bloody towel was thrown over Sharon Tate's head, probably by accident, and Sebring had a noose around his neck. Now knowing all this, I have to ask, was Charles Manson a Freemason? Or perhaps the family was a clandestine Masonic order? I mean, you can take anything, such as the number of stab wounds, you play with them, think up some Masonic conspiracy if you really want there to be one. I'm kind of thinking of how Umberto Eco plays with this sort of thing in Foucault's Pendulum, and he invents his own conspiracies, but when you think about how quickly and chaotically everything happened, it seems doubtful that they were like counting the stabs to create some hidden symbolism to their secret society. It's just, it's ridiculous. One conspiracy theory is that Sir William Gull, having great surgical skill, covered his tracks by cutting so sloppily, but was still able to work with precision. I mean, I guess, but I mean, BTK would deliberately misspell things to throw the police off from the fact that he was an educated man. Serial killers do this kind of thing all the time, uh, such as use different tools and weapons, uh, switch up their modus operandi at all. But here's the thing. William Gull was 71 years old when the Ripper murders were going on. I mean, come on. Uh, not to mention that the year prior to the murders, he had several strokes, which caused uh, limpness on one side of his body, which left him more or less homebound for the rest of his life. So you're telling me a stroked septuagenarian hat was haunting the streets of London, savagely murdering young women? I mean, it's ridiculous. Okay, so let's go back to the motives. What Stephen Knight appears to be completely ignoring in this book is two key acts of British law that would render any concern of a Catholic being able to assume the throne. Firstly, there is the 1701 Act of Settlement, which prevents Catholics from assuming the throne. This act was put in place to prevent James II or his progeny from assuming the throne. Second, there is the 1772 Royal Marriages Act, in which the royal family would contract certain marriages with their approval. Now, while this act would be repealed and reenacted with modifications later, the 1772 Act still stood during the murders and even when Knight was writing this book. In both these acts, Prince Albert's supposed marriage to Annie, if true, would be nullified because it was not approved. Then their child Alice, if she existed, could never be a threat to the throne because if she was Catholic, she would be ineligible to assume the throne. I mean, the whole thing is absolutely preposterous. Okay, so let's give the players the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that William Gull and the others sincerely believed that the clandestine marriage of Prince Albert and Annie did happen and that they had a child who could assume the throne. Let's say they did believe this regardless of the law. And it seems preposterous that they were unaware of these laws, but let's say they were ignorant of these laws. You know what? There's just too many ifs. Uh, one really big issue with even the idea that a group of Masons conspired to kill some East End sex workers to protect the throne, it's just ridiculous. Now, one glaring issue is that Sir William Gull 
the Marquess of Salisbury, Prince Albert et al. These are notable men. I mean, their lives are very well documented. Have you ever heard the conspiracy theory that the real reason Mr. Rogers wore long sleeve cardigans is because he was a sniper in the U.S. military and he was just loaded with military tattoos and the sleeves covered those up? Well, this is ridiculous because Mr. Rogers' life is so well known and documented and scrutinized that there is no time period in which he could have ever possibly have been a sniper, much less gotten a bunch of tattoos. It's preposterous. The same applies here. We might as well start speculating that Abraham Lincoln was secretly a vampire hunter, regardless of how well his life has been documented and scrutinized. Sadly, Knight's work is merely sensational journalism. He really wants to portray himself as a Bob Woodward character with secret informants and connections, clandestine access to secret files, and exposing a gruesome mystery with an anti-Masonic bent. Uh, the work is filled with speculations, buttressing conjectures held up on a flimsy pile of what-ifs. Were this a fictional novel, it would be entertaining, and that's why the graphic novel From Hell is far superior, because it's for entertainment. And the movie is, well, the movie's still entertaining, it's just bad. It's just not a good film. But Knight's book, he portrays it as true crime, but again... It's just sensational journalism with a warped agenda. Before concluding, we need to acknowledge something. All too often, when we explore the crimes of serial killers with morbid fascination, it's easy to forget that their victims were people. They had lives, family, friends, ambitions, desires, heartbreaks, fears. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, Mary Jane Kelly. These are the names of destitute women driven to prostitution to survive, and through their desperation they became victims of a cruel man who appeared one day, injected chaos into London by savagely killing and mutilating their bodies, and then disappeared into the mist of time, never to be seen or heard from again. We get lost in the mystery of Saucy Jack, but... I just want to take a moment to recognize the horror that was inflicted on these poor women, a suffering and terror that is beyond reprehension, and to remember that they were not meat, they were people, and they never got justice. As much as Stephen Knight portrays himself as someone trying to get justice for these poor women, he is actually dishonoring them by using them and their violent and vicious deaths as means to slander a fraternity he just doesn't like really is a bad conspiracy theory that does nothing but try to instrumentalize terror and death to disgrace a group the author does not actually understand. It's not a good read and overall it's in bad taste. When I was first putting this together I originally planned on ending this piece by saying a bunch of gory and horrific things and then concluding with happy Halloween but looking back that is also in bad taste. Now, originally, Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, is a day of venerating the dead. The various observances of veneration for the dead range from somber and serious to lighthearted and convivial. However you commemorate your dead, remembering and honoring them, let us remember and commemorate, without an agenda, these women who died so horrifically and never got justice. And have a blessed All Hallows' Eve. Many thanks goes out to Worshipful Brother Patrick Day for his awesome work in bringing this story to the forefront. Of course, this was you know, sort of themed, as he said, after Halloween in a way. But as always, he brings the facts and humanizes the story, which is always appreciated. And I think it just bears mentioning one more time that those who might be listening, there is a certain type of mason out there. I think that consistently loves to stick to some of these sensational stories and, and uh, types of conspiracy theories and whatnot. And I would just refer you back to those basic facts that Patrick Day put forward more toward the end of the piece that are utterly ignored by the author rather conveniently. But once more, 
Thank you so much to Patrick for your extremely awesome work here. And as always, we look forward to future Masonic Mythbuster segments. Now, the last piece I have for you this week comes again from the Square and Compass, a Journal of Masonry, established 1892, Denver, Colorado. This one is from about 10 years later, April of 1947. It's from volume 46, and it's number three. Something that I find extremely interesting in the Square and Compass magazine, as well as many of the older Masonic publications, is their non-aversion to sort of political ideologies and talking about them. Now, of course, politics is supposed to be kept out of the lodge, which it has been. But this is a magazine that's Masonic, and in this, it's not a tiled lodge. And so many times, things that they start talking about are really interesting because they they hit on these sort of like societal norms and maybe even things that don't seem at a glance political. But I think if I were to share with you an example of this, you might go, oh, yes, I can see how that might be considered political. And still, it's very interesting that this kind of thing presents itself within a Masonic magazine. In fact, on a couple of articles that I've read, you know, just personally, it talks about uh, Supreme Court justices and the mistakes the Masons believe that they have made in allowing those justices to be uh, put into the Supreme Court. Very interesting stuff. Now, what I'm going to read you here is a short article, very short, in fact, and it's just called movie drinking. And so you can guess that, again, this is in 1947. This is after Prohibition. What's interesting here is this is several years after Prohibition has been repealed. So this seems to be just something that is being discussed. Anyway, movie drinking. It is to be hoped the movie industry will not ignore the recent request of federal grand jury in Chicago to take action in, quote, eliminating or reducing to a great extent the drinking scenes in motion pictures. In fact, the movie industry should have done this long ago. In its investigations into juvenile delinquency, the grand jury found many cases attributed to liquor. This, of course, is not directly the fault of the movies, but the grand jury recognizes that motion pictures have a great influence on youngsters, and that, in too many pictures, drinking is presented in such a way as to give young people the impression that it is the smart thing to do. We're well aware that in producing The Lost Weekend, Hollywood turned out a powerful argument against excessive drinking, but this good effort is considerably offset by too many other productions whose influence is in the opposite direction. The members of the Chicago Federal Grand Jury can hardly be called bogeys. Such groups are always made up of representative citizens. As individuals, they undoubtedly hold varied opinions as to the rights of themselves and others to drink. But they obviously agree that drinking should not be presented to teenagers in such a way as to encourage them to drink. We concur. And that's the end of the article. Who is we? Are they talking about the Square and Compass magazine or Masons in general? Is somebody speaking on behalf of all Masons? Uh, Just a very interesting thing to be printed in in such, you know, this argument against, uh, you know, showing excessive drinking in movies. And this, I think, is before the Motion Picture Association of America introduced ratings systems and such. But, and I hope you think about not necessarily the subject matter of the piece, but that such a piece was printed in Masonic magazines. Is it appropriate? Is it not appropriate? And why? I think I have my own thoughts on this and in general you probably already know how i feel about it but in case you don't you can find my thoughts in the uh, craftsman plus facebook group again available to our supporters of the program so that's it for this week i want to thank you all for listening and for coming with us on this edifying journey so one more time let's thank our supporters of the show our contributors fellows producers and legacy partners without you we can't make this program if you're curious on how you can be one of those people who make this happen every single week then head on over to our website wcypodcast.com click on support the show and check out the various options until next week stay on the level for whence came you i'm robert johnson Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
WCY Media.